and welcome to Brothers Speed Podcast, where we discuss black LGBT issues and topics, and I'm your host, Chris, and we are back with part two of HIV within the transgender community. Remember from last time, we actually have more stories that pretty much illustrate the life of a person growing within transgender and pretty much tr- trying to find their truth. Some of the stories you've probably already heard are very interesting. They're very enlightening in terms of what it is to be a person of transgender. So I wanted to see um, if maybe we wanted to open it up to the audience to ask any of the panelists um, questions about anything about, about this topic tonight. Did you feel so intimidated that you couldn't stand your ground? Like, like you said in Hidden Figures, that one woman... She came back and she said, you know, fuck you, yeah. blah, blah, yeah. blah. She was after, wonderful at it. After, after some time there, I did do something. Now, do you all know Help Me Howard on Channel 7? No. Yeah. Okay. He does stories. Oh, he does. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 let me get the mic in front of my mouth. I have a big mouth. I thought she could hear me. Um so Help Me Howard is a person on Channel 7 that um, people contact when they're having a situation, a legal situation, and he tries to get them the proper legal guidance and maybe resolve it. So one day, this is after me being there probably uh, about two years, I said, you know what? I, was, I had wa- I seen a, uh, one of his um, segments. I said, you know what? Let me shoot them an email and see what they said what they say. And the tagline was, Tranny Peas in the Bushes. Oh, they called me, honey. They called me right away. (laughs) So, I did the story, but I made them promise that they would not mention the company. That's how, because I was scared to like jeopardize my job and get fired. But at the same time, I wanted my story out there. So I found like a, a, you know, middle ground to do that. All right, the story ran on a Friday, I think it was, or a Monday. When I went into work, I was at my, I I walked in, and let me tell you, it seemed like the whole place had seen the story. I could feel the energy, you know? So I walk in, I sit at my desk, I'm signing on, and not even three minutes, one of the secretaries from Human Resources comes, she says, "Sign, sign off off your computer, come with me. So I, I picked up my bag and I followed her. Well, now they think they have a lawsuit. And on top of it, the uh, human resource manager that was there when I was hired, he had just left. So there was a lady that took over his position. She ended up being very apologetic. Um, and it kind of shifted things for me. Um, they, they let me use a bathroom that was on a lower level because by this time we were in another building and so she says if you can use the bathroom the ladies room but can you use the one on the first floor because it's not as much traffic as opposed to your floor where where it's a lot of traffic just to kind of keep things you know a little on the I guess not stir up things and so I said okay well at least I didn't have that far to go and I could use the bathroom. So I, I, I agreed to that. So it did kind of resolve, you know. That it was still a schlep just to pee. Yeah, it was. It was. But these are the things you, you know, as a trans person, you put up with to to maneuver. Now, now fortunately, things have gotten better since that time. Um, there are laws, like here in Broward County, transgender is included, like um, uh, gender expression is included on the um, human rights ordinance now. When I was working at that particular company, it wasn't. So they could get away with these things because we weren't protected. I think that happened in 2012 or 11. I can't remember, but yeah. So so, so do you feel whole now? (laughs) Oh my God. I love it because Oh, do I feel whole? You know what? I, I'm going to tell you. I, I, I've certainly had a journey. My life has been really like quite a journey. And I think all of us, no matter whether you're trans or gay or heterosexual, I think we're all evolving 
and hopefully getting to a point where we do feel whole. Because if it isn't gender for you, it's something else for you. You know, it's, it's something else. So for me, I, I, I've come a long way and I, I'm in a place now where I feel a lot better than I did. You know, dealing with PTSD, with, you know, being brutally beaten up and agoraphobia because I could sit in front of a camera and know millions of people are watching me, but the camera was my protection. For me to walk through a mall at one time was, oh my God, I would freak out because it's the fear of the response that you're going to get and how people are going to react to you. So I've come a long way and I, I'm at a point now where, <coughs> I'm sorry about the cold, um, I'm at a point now where I think I, there's days where I don't feel male or female. I just am. And really this body is temporary anyway. It's the spirit, the, the energy that we are. And so I kind of like moved away from being so rigid with the gender and I'm a woman. I mean, of course, I identify more as female. I mean, look at me. I, 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 I feel very female, but I'm not in bondage to it because I know that this is all temporary and it really is my spirit that, you know, transcends into eternity and, and, and touches people. When someone dies... You don't think about the clothes they wore or the car they drove or, you know, the hairstyle they had. You think about the way that person touched your life. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. And sure. Ra Raji's story about the workplace discrimination also leads a lot of trans people to put themselves in risky situations, expose themselves to HIV through, you know, other means to get employment, such as like sex work and things like that. They're very high risk. And also, just using the bathroom, a lot of transgender women and trans guys have been raped in the bathroom. Again, exposing them to um, you know, HIV and other risk factors. Just trying to use the bathroom, and, and this is what's happening. And just for Raj to use the bathroom closer, having to call Channel 7 News. That's probably not something that many of us have to worry about going to work. So this is why we see some of these institutional barriers contributing to the HIV epidemic uh, for, for a lot of trans, um, trans folks. Um, Michael, do you want to say anything or uh, any other questions? We only have about like three more minutes before we wrap up. Yes. I have another quick question. Um, so I agree with you, like what you said earlier, past couple of years, the trans story has come to more light. But does anyone feel what your thoughts, I feel like, the trans woman story is kind of there. Is does the trans men story get kind of overshadowed yeah. by the trans woman story? They're shaking their heads. And Tatiana, you <laughs> probably. Yeah, I agree. It does. It does. Um, don't you agree, Tati? And I think Tati can um, uh, speak to this uh, really well with the trans <laughs> man. No. <laughs> oh my God! Wait. <laughs> I, I don't mean to put you out there, girl. I'm sorry. But. <laughs> Okay. Well, um, I think the reason she said that I can, and I guess, can handle this topic, because um, my partner is a trans man. So, um, I hear all of the challenges, and yes, that is, he says that the trans woman overshadows the trans man, and we have a group, Trans Inclusive, and it's trans men and women meeting, and he still said that the trans men still need a space because the trans women in the group still overpowers the group. So that that would be a yes from his um, standpoint. And what I found to be interesting dating him is that some of the same challenges that we have in the workplace and other places, they experience the same thing as well. So I used to think things were more just trans woman related, but I started to realize it's, it's the same all the way around. So... Um, that would be, yeah, but there, we are overshadowed. But the truth of the matter is um, trans men just recently started being more visible and trans women were continuously out there. So most of the trans men would be living stealth, which is like, you know, um, a lot of people didn't know who they were. So they weren't kind of out. Now they're starting to be more visible. So that kind of like changes the, the narrative when it comes to the transgender population. I think that's um, a part of it. So I would have to say yes to your question. Can I? Can I oh, oh, is the, the you guys want to talk about that? 
Thank you. Um, at Compass, we actually we have a, uh, a separate group. We have the gender support group, which is for everybody, and then we have a separate group for female to male, um, for trans men. Um, and I think you know, as a question like that, and to kind of go back to the first question that you would have asked, you know, where is this gap? Um, I think about the on my way down here, trying to think, you, you see the numbers, you see the statistics, and there is, it's a, the, the number of trans people is, what did you say, three times, I think, is then other populations, and you ask yourself why, where is that, and you look and you start thinking about all of the different reasons, um, lower socioeconomic status, um, uh, ability to get jobs, access health care, stigma, all of that thing. So where do you where do you start? Where do you where do you dive into this? And I started to think about I'm a former teacher, so I'm a, I'm big on education. My answer comes in there. They, we have to educate, but it's not just as simple as saying we have to educate. Well, who do you have to educate? I think that there are really um, two major groups. You have to educate medical professionals because the 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 medical needs of transgender people are not cut and dry. And I think, you know, from society's perspective, okay, if you go from one to the other, okay, male to female or female to male, and then you to think, but there are expensive surgeries. Not everybody has the surgeries. Hormones do very strange things to, um, I know for female to male, you know, um, their vaginas, the uterus, the you know all of that. What what testosterone will do to that organ and those organs? And I'm I'm being very realistic and very raw, and I, mm -hmm. but it is um, it is something that's not so known to medical professionals, to some trans people themselves, um, male to female, post op, you know, post op vagina. It, it has different tissue um, than female vaginas um, and it is it is something again that, that a lot of people don't think about and a lot of people don't you know they just they just don't go there and so you have to educate the medical profession on how to address these issues how to get to these people how to reach these people to make sure that when they come the experiences that they have are positive experiences and they need to build that trust because if you have trans people out there that every time going to the doctor I mean, can you imagine as a, as a trans uh, male, and I can, you know, to have a, an identity problem or a dysphoria with that part of your body and to have to go to the gynecologist on a regular basis? I mean, you know, what that's like. But getting back to the education aspect of it, we also have to educate ourselves. We have to be aware of what's going on. We have to think about these things. And, like, um, to to go in again <clears throat> trans women right now medically there's no science that's going to make this happen yet cannot get pregnant so if they're out there and they're in a higher risk situation uh, sex work uh, just even with a partner do they think i don't need a condom you know and then think about that unprotected sex where that can lead and all of these different types of things i mean these are unique situations that we might have not been dealing with in the past that we do need to start dealing with. Um, and we all need to think about that. We need to, you know, we need to be able to approach that honestly and openly um, so that we can start to reduce that amount of that gap, that, that difference, and why our numbers are so high. Sorry, sorry. I'm not even sure if there's anything left to say. <laughs> Um, so no, I mean, it really goes back, well, you said a lot, I all said a lot, like, this is the most knowledgeable panel I've ever been on in my life. Um, so no, I mean, it really comes back to, like, especially, like, for, um, female to male individuals, like, being sure that the healthcare provider is adequately educated, and that sometimes just the patient, the patient is still adequately educated, um, remembering that there is, there's, there's still the potential to get pregnant, there's still the potential for other STDs for trans men, and especially like having, like taking the dysphoria out of it, like it's easier said than done. Um, so like having to go to a gynecologist and like basically having to say like over the phone, like I'm looking for an OBGYN, 
even though I don't identify as a female, I still have the biological parts for it. So sometimes it can be that. Um, other times it's having the medical professional who's like, you know what, I know what you got. We know what we're working mm-hmm. with. This is the issue. Um, so really just education on like the medical provider. And um, also like I've seen like being in the field of HIV, like we've had more um, campaigns that have been geared toward the um, trans community, trans men and trans women. Um, so I'm just keeping up the good fight, education. <laughs> education is key. You can tell we work in the same place. Right? I'm gonna education. I'm gonna close out my comment with this. Okay. Um, we are here addressing HIV in a transgender community, and for me, this really stems deep. And I think we have to go there and have real conversation. Um. And I want to say this in no attack on anyone when I make this statement. When I looked at the flyer and it was an hour conversation to have about transgender and HIV, I thought an hour, what could we get done in an hour? My group weekly is an hour and a half, but I guess we'll figure it out. As I mentioned earlier, we have to take the same time that we allocate and we give to other populations to address issues We have to give that trans population the same respect. When it comes to marketing and advertising, we have to give that population the same respect. Until we, as community, treat that population equal, we will continue to be disadvantaged. And that's important, us as a community. Um, I might can think of a few reasons why there are not people in the room today. But we have to understand that when it comes to HIV, it's not just a trans issue, it's a people issue. Because to the, the, the be truthful, when it comes to the trans population, these women, especially the trans women, they are sleeping with the heterosexual men. So when you think that these trans women are isolated in this place by themselves, no, sweetie. No, darling. She can potentially been sleeping with your husband, your boyfriend. So when you're thinking it's just her, you have to step back and look at it. Because remember, these women are presenting as women. And we looking good these days. And I don't want you to think for one minute, we not, the men are not like, wow. You know, and thinking, I wonder what that's like. And sometimes they, they, they act on that. So you have to take into account that this is the everybody issue. And I said earlier, I like to be all when I do something. And I don't like to be a part of programs or anything because I don't only do this here, but when I'm sitting at the health department, I'm just as vocal. And I, I tell them, this is what it is. Let's put it on the table. So for me, it's important that we give the same respect and the equality when we're doing stuff like this to make sure that we are being able to educate and we're not just saying, hey, I did something for the transgenders. See, here you go. We can't do that because we'll continue to, to fall into this and what's going on. So we have to be mindful. And I, and this is, and I want to say this, and I'll let you have the mic, Raj. I'm a black trans woman, and I've been moving about this county, both state and Broward. And for me, when we're doing stuff like this, you, you have to reach out. Because when you see women and men in community that could help, and especially when we're talking about trans women, because what we didn't address is that when we're talking about HIV and trans folk, we have to talk about black trans women being the highest infected. So we can't leave that out and just lump it as HIV and trans people. We have to focus on what it is. So when we know that's what we're focusing on, somehow we have to figure out how do we get to that population? Because the reason I started doing work is in community, looking at the HIV rates when it comes to the trans women, my first thought was, okay, I'm sitting in this room. I see a lot of, no disrespect to anyone, white faces in the room, but I'm looking at the HIV rates and I'm like, well, all these black and brown and black people are infected. Why none of these women and men are in the room? So I said to myself, well, you have to change that. And I started to change what the room looked like. I started putting my work in. And as I started to do the work, and I would bring these women in the room, and I would see other people starting to treat them as a number. You know, oh, 
you know what, come over here. Because if you come to my meeting, I can show I had five black trans women, of uh, three of them. And you can't do that. These people have feelings and these people have emotions. And these women are very per perceptive. Remember when you say these women come from sex work, their lives depend on them being very perceptive because the people they deal with can be the very people that can take their lives. So they can tell when you are feeding them, no pun intended, bullshit. They can tell it. So first we have to address it and be real about it. And that way we'll tackle it. Yeah. No, I just thought it was and you know, I wanted to piggyback on what you said because that is why they really can't lump men having sex with men because we trans women we attract uh, the basically heterosexual men, so it's a, it's it's a different population. Um, you know, there are special type of heterosexual men that happen to have a, a liking to trans girls too. But a lot, most of these men, I would say 95% of these men, maybe 98%, they like biological women too. So they like trans women and they're going back and forth, back and forth. Joseph, you made the point about using my employment experience. And that's why like, you know, when people stigmatize a group and, you know, they say, oh yeah, those trannies, they're sex workers, you know. But you have to think, and fortunately, all of us aren't, you know. But I'm just saying, like, you know, a lot of us have had to do that. If you think about what perpetuates a situation, well, if the girls aren't getting hired, if there's no, if the employment discrimination is really, really high, or if they're giving you hell to even work at a job, you know, those things play into the sex work. It really does. It does. You know, because people are going to do what they need to do to survive. You know, they're going to do what, not that they necessarily want to do it, but, you know, it's a survival thing. So I just wanted to piggyback on you. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Tatiana, for bringing that up. Yeah, I really, because it's important. It really is. Really, it's an open floor. Any other oh, questions for the question. panelists or um, anything else the panelists want to share? Um, hi, I'm Brianna. Um, I'm part of Trans Inclusive Group. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I see that you guys say that you do a lot of HIV AIDS work with, trans, with the transgender population in community. What community are you talking about? Because... Are we, are we looking over here or over here? All of them. Oh, everybody, okay. Where do you do your work? Because I don't reside in Wilton Matters. And every time I get around places and I come to the meeting, it's like all these different things I find out that is taking place in Wilton Manors. But the message is stuck in Wilton Manors. It's not going abroad. And there's people, it needs to reach Dade County, needs to reach Broward, needs to reach Fort Lauderdale, um, West Palm Beach. But your message is stuck solely home base. So who are we really reaching? within the trans population? Well, I work on Wilton Manners, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I know, and I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, I think this goes deeper, and this is why I say we have to go back to government. We have to go to the people that are put in place, that are funded to reach other populations, and for them not to only work in Wilton Manners. Because, Health Department and the CDC may fund fund organizations, especially here in Broward County. But if the organization isn't comfortable working in different locations and they don't serve the population, you are absolutely correct. The message, the people are underserved. So I agree with you totally. But until we have someone that holds these people accountable, that will continue to happen. I can only speak from my agency standpoint. And I can't speak for all agencies in Wilton Manners, and I do agree with you. I'd like to. So um, I think that you came in after we introduced ourselves, and Dylan and I work at Compass Community Center, which is up in Lake Worth in Palm Beach County. And we are the only direct service providers to the LGBTQ community um, in Palm Beach County. Um, Compass started. 30 years ago, we're going into our 30th year of existence, 
specifically to deal with the AIDS epidemic because of the lack of government response. And it was when citizens had to take it into their own hands. And it's grown into a community center that has... Uh, we're responsible for Palm Beach, Palm Beach, oh my goodness, why is that time? Pride, Pride, our Pride Fest, Palm Beach Pride, uh, Stonewall Ball, a bunch of other things. And so you look at Compass and you see, but I am involved with the marketing and you're talking about getting your message out there. And we try to get it out there. And I think what is one of the largest growing segments of the population dealing with HIV and AIDS is uh, how old, 18 to 24? What is it? 13 to 24. And we ask ourselves all the time, and I see the prevention department struggle with it all the time, how do we reach these people? How do we reach these people? And there is a part of it that comes down to the fact that we can have all of the messaging that we want, and we do. If those people aren't listening and looking for it on some level, it's going to go unheard. Go ahead. Well, how can I find it? Because before Tatiana got in community here mm -hmm. and brought me in, I could never find it, even mm -hmm. if I was looking for it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if somebody doesn't know, I don't do social media. So if you're telling me you're advertising on social media, that's not going to reach a person like me. Okay. If you're telling me that you are not going out beyond your borders, you're not going to reach a person like me because I'm not within your borders. Mm -hmm. So how do I look for it? How do I find it? Or how do I reach people? It's got to be a way that we push beyond our borders and our boundaries. And I'm sorry, but... Mm -hmm. Did the funding that your, your facility get only said Wilton Matters? Or it did it said Fort Lauderdale? Well, I'm more than sure it's for Broward County. Um, it, 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 <laughs> I'm so more than your, sure it's for Broward County. Your water should go from County Line and, Road. And we do as much as we can, but we're not the only organization that's charged with reaching the county to lower the incidences of HIV. That's the first. So you have other community-based organizations are charged with the same thing that gets funding to do that as well. We only can do what we can do. But I, like I said, I agree with you. I do feel that all of the organizations, and I feel this is a, a, a different conversation that may need to be had at a different place. It may be, need to be had at the health department where they are in charge of allocating this funding and that your voice can be heard there and explain that to them so they can rectify that. But I agree with you totally. So, you know, I know we do as much as we can, but we're not the only organization that's charged with lowering the incidence of HIV in the county. Can I, can I address on this too? Because we learned early on here in the museum, we learned early on here at the museum that we're not going to get groups of people in here and that we need to really need to reach out beyond our building and our four walls. And, and it's not so much want to grant money. There is money out there. I think the bigger struggle is the manpower. There are not enough people like these folks that are brave enough to come to the forefront and talk on a microphone in front of total strangers, to talk on television. Um, you know, and we have people that will sit at the front desk and make me red ribbons. But I, don't, it, I think manpower, if you believe, is, is one of our issues too, not just the money. It's about manpower, people willing enough to take a stance. And I went into a school, and the, the kid called me faggot. And I said, okay, Sheriff, throw him out. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. So I think that's part of it, too, is just the manpower of getting enough people to be brave enough to come to the forefront and, and speak on whether it be HIV or transgender or GOBT issues, anything. You know, it's tough to get the manpower. I think that's the, one of the biggest issues. Well, I'm here. <laughs> and I got a lot of manpower. <laughs> I got, I got, a, I'm, to put it out there, I got a whole group of manpower. So... <laughs> So I'm here. So whenever, whenever you want to use use your privilege to help us with this manpower, I'm here, and that's transinclusive.org. You can you can reach us there if you want. It's on it's online if you want, or you can reach me as well. Yeah. If I may, it sounds like the young lady here is saying that. I mean, maybe like like if you had saddle like you have satellite offices, you have like an office in Hollywood or something where, where that you might go to one day a week or one night a week or somewhere else. Or so. sometimes you don't even frequent 
a certain community. Right. I'm, I'm a person of color, so, and you talking about survival sex work, I've done that. And I haven't seen anyone come on, I've worked Dade and Broward. I worked with, um, South Beach, 79th Street, 27th over here in Broward, Sunrise. I haven't seen community, and you guys are in community. So, I haven't seen people. So you haven't seen the Pride Center, Alan Sistrom? Well, well, the process is going to be strong. We do. We do. Yeah. We do. 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 Because what needs to happen is we need to identify folks that are going to have the heart for the community. Because what I realized in working um, closer with Tatiana more and more, it's um, you got to connect with people and they need to trust you. And we send people out there to sit drunk, but they may not get the same um, result that I would get when I go out there. Because I'm genuinely concerned about you and your health and the things that concern you. And I, and I, meet, I met you not too long ago and I'm like, I think I know her. I'm like... Did I meet her? I feel like I know her, and I don't. But it's because I care about what you care about. And the things that you need, I want to make sure that I can do whatever is in my power to get that to you. And as far as the funding is concerned, that is my plan for us to make sure that we use those fundings that we get. Because just like you said, to County Line Road all the way down to what's the other dividing factor to take you into Palm Beach. I don't know. I can't remember what the divide, dividing factor is for the boundary. I plan on making sure that we, we do the work and we reach the community and the population that is in need and that is, you know, highly infected or impacted by this disease that we should have dealt with long ago, you know? So um, bear with us as we do that because we do send people out there um, on a weekly basis, but it's just the, the, the idea that community needs to know also that you really care and that I'm not just, like Tatiana mentioned, a number. Because so many times people go they get the numbers that they need for their deliverables, and then you don't see them again. And that's that's the simple fact to it all. And I don't want us to ever be that. When I say us, I mean the Pride Center. And as long as I'm there, I'm definitely making sure that they do what, what they say they have for that particular population. No, I just have one thing. So. <laughs> I'll leave you, um, you know what also I noticed is the fact that sometimes a skill set to be able to reach all those other people, they stay in the place where they can make money. Yet, and the thing about it is that the skill set, meaning that they actually study social media, because it's a whole other animal, so especially they study what exactly it's going to take to really reach you. Those are the people that sometimes they don't want to go into nonprofit. They don't want to go into, they don't want to put their heart into it. So even just me coming from the corporate, and just, you know, I got into just, you know, just being in around the nonprofit world for a little for a couple of years now, but I got into it not because I really wanted to. I got into it because somebody said, "Just go and see what these people are doing." All right, it was like that. And once I saw the amount of people who were in it for the heart, that's what attracted me. Other than that, I, would, I probably never would have really came. So when I started coming to meetings and started giving out suggestions, you didn't tell me you didn't think about this, 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 right. this. They did not have a clue. Because some of the people are coming from a different background, not from the expertise who may be dealing with marketing, what they deal with accounting, finance, not all the time. Or if that's if there is, they're not the people <coughs> on the ground. Right. They're not the people on the ground. So it takes a little bit of a difficult time to sometimes right. to reach when sometimes they are not they're not necessarily really people who come from an expertise that's to be able to lend that right. to them. So that's also another thing, because like for instance, now give me, don't get me wrong. What we're talking about also is a lot of grassroots. Grassroots, he's right. That's manpower that a lot of people really are not getting paid for. It's all coming from the heart, and a lot of people just don't want to do it. So you got expertise and specialized in what they do. Not put some some of those people are not willing to reach it. Manpower, and then you have the community. Yes, you're, you're right. Safety is going to be an issue. 
Uh, when you go to the church, you're not going to be well welcomed. You go here, you're not going to be well welcomed. So we want to keep our manpower, but do we put them at risk? And how much risk do you really put them out there? It becomes uh, kind of a dicey, in my opinion. I could be wrong. Oh. I mean, um, <laughs> well, all right. I think part of what it is really pay it forward. It, that always rings truth in my mind because, as we know, there's a lot of people who are all in the same meetings. So we see the same people going to the same meetings, and there's a lot of meetings and a lot of discussions. And what she said earlier is, how can we do this one an hour in one hour or in your meetings an hour and a half? No, it can't. Because, you know, we could sit here for the next six months and talk and still have questions that are unanswered. So it's about paying it forward that we're here, we're getting knowledge. I know some people here that came here just to hear this story because they didn't have much information about the transgender story. So once again, it's about being in our mouths and in our conversation and our communication. So that way, down the road, oh, hey, you're transgender. You you're looking for services? Go here. Go there. So it's about just getting that pay it forward and, and passing it on, you know, one by one. No, I agree. I, I agree. But like you said, it takes expertise. And until we, as a community, understand that, because a question was asked to me about having um, a lot of trans representation and leadership in like places like D.C., Philadelphia, and New York. And when I look back and I look at Miami-Dade and I look at Broward County, there's a lack of that. And I think, I'm not sure if this community is set up for that or even want to entertain that. Because I don't think they want to pass the torch. I don't think they want too much trans representation you may be good to be a facilitator that's what you are you're not good enough to be an executive director or a ceo of an organization and i think that's the way they want to keep it and you as the trans individual like me you can't tell me that and you can't tell me my expertise and you can't tell me about a population um, and I'll say this, I transitioned at 16. I'm 45 and to be 46 very soon. You can't tell me about the transgender population. I know it. I lived it. I know what sex work looked like. I did it for 25 years. So when I tell you my story, that's because I know it. I don't have to read about it on the CDC. I don't have to deal with none of that. I know it. I can tell you anything. I've done slept next to girlfriends. I've had to rush people to, I know it, I get it. So I'm not going to let you tell me I don't know what I'm talking about just because you may have that education or you may have that executive director or CEO position because what I will do is show you the resilience in me coming from that. And one day I'll show you how the work will get done because I'm determined to do that and make change in community. And as I like to say, for my people, and not only for trans people, I speak as a black woman as well. Because the one thing I've always remembered before I even knew I was trans, I identify with being black. Can I make just one comment? Mm -hmm. I think part of the problem that trans people have to begin with is the fact that most people do not understand the whole mentality of you're born one thing and you're not that thing. And people just, they don't get it. They just don't. Yeah, you're right. I know people exactly don't understand. Saying, yeah. People don't understand gay yeah. to begin with. And now you're taking it to, never mind another level, you're, you're like on another planet right. in many ways. I agree. So that's a really great comment because it I brings agree. us back to we need to all do and support and further more education and dialogue out in the community. And something that you can do to pay it forward and put what we're talking about tonight into action is you have many amazing organizations and uh, people that you can uh, call upon. And I invite you to consider in your own community where you have a sphere of influence set up a night for people to come and learn 
and have a dialogue on the topic of gender and transgender because gender does affect everyone. Unfortunately, trans, trans folks get the brunt of our gender binary in our society. Um, so you have a lot of amazing guest speakers, Tatiana and other organizations here that can facilitate those kind of conversations to bring the education forward um, for everyone. Got to take a moment to give a big shout out to DJ Baker with the weekly top 40. It's the first LGBT urban countdown from artists from around the world. Tune in every single Saturday live from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. exclusively on alldigitalradio.com. 